My name is Joe Reedy. I'm the chair of ULI Columbus. And on behalf of our partners in Insight 2050, Morpsey and Columbus 2020, I'm inviting you and welcoming you to um, the first public showing of the results of this important initiative. Where and how we grow in central Ohio are two of the most important questions that we face as we look for the future growth and development of our community. The good news that you'll hear tonight is we are growing. But if we don't do that in a planful, careful way, who knows what the outcome will be. Um, we've had a lot of folks working with us on this, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank them. From Morpsey, William Murdoch, Kirsten Carr, and Laura Kaprowski. From Columbus 2020, Kenny McDonald and Jung Kim. From ULI Columbus, Yarmer Steiner, Terry Fogler, Chris Shire, and Cheryl Pantella. And um, most importantly, our staff, who've really assisted us in, in being able to participate in this, uh, Alicia Gaston and Aaron Blair. Truly important for the ability to bring this off was to find matching funds to pair up with federal funds that Morpsey had um, for use in, in this. And um, those folks that helped us with the matching funds are Casto, Columbus Foundation, Continental Real Estate, L Brands Foundation, and the Easton Community Foundation. Without their support, and the support of Columbus 2020, this would not have happened. Finally, we're really happy to make this a free event tonight and want to make particular thanks to the Easton Community Foundation and Columbus 2020 who covered the cost of this event. Terry Fogler uh, from the city of Dublin and the uh, mission advancement chair from ULI Columbus has worked on the steering committee for Insight 2050, and at this point, I'll hand it off to him. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Um, in terms of the why we've engaged in the Insight 2050 initiative, I think uh, ULI, which is a relatively new district council uh, for the ULI organization, Central Ohio, um, has been very active in exploring uh, broader issues of regional growth and development. If you remember the Columbus 2050 initiative a couple of years ago, it started to look almost in a visionary way what was coming forth with the region. Uh, it uh, engaged a lot of participants in discussion about regional growth and development. Uh, I had also been involved with Morpsey uh, on the Sustainable Growth Committee. I knew that they were looking at some options to understand some of the planning related to the transportation uh, planning that they needed to do. And with others' engagement with uh, Columbus 2020, who were actively involved with the growth and development of the region, uh, there was a missing piece with regard to how that region ought to develop. Uh, I think brought together a coalition of folks focused on this question that how the region grows and develops is critically important. And the fact that there's some data and information that suggests the things that drive that growth and development are likely to be significantly different in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years than they have been. Uh, we began to look at models that analyze the impacts of different scenarios. Uh, and that led us to a series of firms. Part of it was a book that I had read that actually uh, Peter Calthorpe uh, had written in 2011 urbanism in the age of climate change, which really applied, I think, some of this work that was being done in California and other locations, to look for folks who had done these kind of models. I think Morpsey did the RFP process. We looked at a series of firms. And uh, Peter Calthorpe with Calthorpe and Associates clearly emerged as the folks who were most aligned with the kind of data and information analysis that we thought made sense and would be helpful to the region. And Peter will give you the product of that, of that effort tonight. Um, as many of you may know, Peter is, um, probably one of the leading voices in uh, planning, urban design, uh, architecture, uh, has been one of the founders uh, of the New Urbanism Congress, uh, has been actively involved both nationally and internationally in a wide variety of, of planning issues. And I think was, make sure I get this one correct, 
was named um, one of the 25 innovators on the cutting edge by Newsweek of 25 folks because of the work related to some of this analysis of growth and development uh, is ideally situated, I think, to, to help us uh, not only perform the analysis but understand some of the implications. Uh, what we'd like to do is have uh, Peter give an overview of, uh, of that analysis for you, his impressions. You'll find him to be, I think, very candid uh, on that. I don't think we've given too many sanitizing instructions on this with regard to, although he is aware of the, some of the hot button words that we, that we uh, uh, are aware of in the region. Uh, with that said, at the end, we'll have a brief discussion uh, with Peter and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. When we do do that, I'll remind you again later, there's a microphone in the middle of the room there we'd ask you to use, kind of state your name. Uh, on that pose the question. Uh, but with that, I'd like to introduce uh, to you Peter Calthorpe. Thank you. Oh, yeah, there we go. You take this with me. Your oh, microphone. yeah, are all these microphones going to fight each other? No, it works. Excellent. Uh, where to start? You know, I want to thank ULI, and I'm not normally a polite person. I'm <laughs> really blunt, typically. But I've watched ULI in the last 25 years shift from being advocates for business as usual to being advocates for the next generation of good development. And it's really warmed my heart. I have to tell you that. I mean, it's uh, extraordinary to see a really substantial organization like that that represents um, the, the, one of the most powerful and important groups of people in our country, the people who shape our future effectively, uh, shift gears and move uh, towards really thinking about the fact that the world changes, the country changes, land use has to change, and, and in the midst of all that change, there are some immutable, timeless elements that need to be constantly you know, kind of referred back to. Like, what is a great place to live? What makes strong, sustainable communities? These are really substantial issues that need to be revisited. We all live in our, in our stovepipes, you know, exactly what we're doing, you know, and we tend to focus on professionally what it is we know the most about. Um, the community builders that was started by J.C. Nichols, the ULI, uh, was in its inception, uh, an effort to think big and think holistically. And I will be blunt, at some points they got a little off that track. <laughs> but now they're back on it, and I'm really happy to validate that and support it. And, and, uh, and so I, I will take a moment to thank them for, this, uh, for supporting this whole effort and being a part of this. With that said, I'll say we've now spent I just nine months learning about your community. And I'm kind of astounded because typically we're invited into places that are in crisis, that have giant problems, congestion, air quality, affordable housing, uh, you know, stagnant job growth. And yet this place has none of those crises. And yet you're willing to look forward. I mean, typically the only time people are willing to look forward is when they have a problem. Uh, the rest of the time they just sit back and enjoy the ride. Uh, in this case, you guys seem to be ready to get out in front of the issues. Uh, and I think that's a really big part of what I'm going to report back to you today, is that there are problems in front of you. You can fall into the same ditches that the other cities in the rest of the country have fallen prey to. But if you think uh, long term and holistically, you can actually avoid it. And the fact that you are undertaking this effort, I think, is a signal that you're, you're actually going to uh, succeed in, in not uh, failing where others have fallen. So with that, I'll start with a, big, a kind of a snapshot of where the country is and then move on to exactly where you are in relationship to that. So in the US, there's this huge range of issues. I mean, it seems like everywhere you turn, there's a problem that needs to be solved. And each one of these problems typically get handled uh, by a, special, a group of specialists, a special government department, uh, a, a set of professionals that are aligned to it. And the only place where you see the connections, where you connect the dots between all these challenges, is in land use. Because every one of these issues here 
is directly related to land use. And in fact, it turns out that land use and community design is the one place where you can actually solve a lot of these problems effortlessly and simultaneously. And if you don't solve them that way, if you try to take them on one at a time, you end up with monumental struggles. And so, you know, for example, obesity, and actually I don't have data on obesity for in, in this analysis, but we're working on it now, so it's on my mind. You know, obesity is related to lots of things, but one of the things it's related to is daily activity. How walkable is the community? How often does a kid get on a bicycle? Or how often is he driven to wherever he's going? Um, how often do you drive to exercise? There's another way of putting that, <laughs> which happens all the time. You know, so there's a kind of natural solution here, which may seem simplistic, which is why not make neighborhoods where you can walk, where your kids are safe? Well, that extrapolates into a whole range of other issues. Well, if your kids are walking, the streets have to be human scale and the traffic needs to be sl moving slowly. The neighborhood needs to be safe. Well, what does that mean? It needs to have eyes on the street. All these things relate to urban design, to other things as well, but to urban design in some fundamental way. So the fundamental shifts, the big challenges. We are aging. This is an aging population. Japan, you know, everybody looks at the Japanese stagnant economy. It's a manifestation of the fact that their population is not growing at all and it's aging at the same time. So they have a declining workforce in relationship to a, um, uh, a retirement, a larger and larger retirement cohort. Here, uh, we do have an aging population, but because of immigration and uh, a little more uh, uh, fertile in <laughs> uh, family structures, uh, we seem to be still growing, and growth is good. The one thing you guys have, and I'll point this out, is that you have growth to work with. If you were in Detroit, you know, not only do you have a depressed economy and a shifting workforce set of demands, but you have no growth. Growth is the most uh, healthy thing you could have to re remedy future and current problems. And so growth is a big part. But what kind of growth? Well, here you can see in the US, we're no longer mom and pop and the kids. It's not an Ozzy and Harriet world anymore. One size doesn't fit all. The, the, the house on the cul-de-sac is not everybody's first choice, even though it seems to be, quote unquote, the American dream, and it's a mental habit everybody has that this is who we are, and if you try to change it, you're un-American in some way. The reality, of course, is we're only less than a quarter of the population are families with kids. Now, there's new people moving into that category, and then there are older people moving out of that category. It's all life cycle. But uh, the fact that over 75% of the households need something perhaps other than large homes on large lots in great school districts is an important thing to finally come to terms with. And I think to some degree, um, our paradigm of who we are hasn't really grasped that. Now, the other big challenge, of course, is no matter how much asphalt you put out there, you will have congestion. The amazing thing is you don't. So this is a dilemma that you can avoid, but you're not going to avoid it by building more roads. Uh, we, I can give you countless examples in countless regions across the country and the world where more highways never solve the problem. Uh, if you create capacity, normally it induces trips and you end up in the same place. Costs. Once again, you're, you're, you're not confronting the crisis that many other communities are in affordable housing. But the idea of affordable housing has to be expanded. What ha happened in 2008 was a product not just of bad loans, but it was that people overreached in their personal economies when they really didn't understand the relationship between transportation costs and housing costs. People moved to more and more distant suburbs to get more affordable housing because the farther away you were, the more affordable it was. And they didn't take into account the costs of transportation. But look at these numbers here. Um, on average, it's about 50%. And look how close, 20% and 27% of household income goes to uh, cars and and housing. 
And then as you get into more low-income communities, those ratios go up and people become more and more disadvantaged. But people don't recognize that in many communities, transportation is as expensive as housing. Um, and that's the, the burden of the auto culture. Um, now, what we've also seen is that this problem is accelerating, which actually does lead a little bit into that whole collapse in 08. We built a lot of large lot single family. Uh, it was not what the market needed or could afford when you looked at total household budgets. And therefore, it had to, it had to be, one way or another, discounted in value. And we did it abruptly in 08, and it was much to the detriment of the global economy. But look at what was happening. Housing costs in increased at over 50%, transportation costs going up, the combination uh, going up dramatically more than household income. And when you have that kind of diverging numbers, you have a deep problem. So the, the corrective notion here is to get an economy in balance, you need to get what is the 800 pound gorilla in the household pocketbook <coughs> under control, housing and transportation. How do you do that? You right size the housing. You get the right kind of housing for the right population and you get it in a place where people don't have to own three cars. Uh, it's kind of a simple fundamental solution. And the good news is the market is headed there anyway. So it's not like you're struggling uphill to, to change people's behavior. You just have to respond to their needs. So here in Ohio, uh, this analysis starts with the first question, which is how much growth are you gonna have? In many communities, that's a big debate. The good news here is you have robust growth and you ought to put your arms around it. The big question is what kind of growth does that represent? How do you fit the land use policies that you have and the transportation policies that you have to who you really are becoming. Not who you are, but who are you becoming? And what's the next generation need? And then in order to understand that, what are the impacts? And that's all the metrics that I'm gonna show you and we're gonna get into, unfortunately, a whole lot of bar graphs. And this is gonna be like a classroom, uh, not an entertaining speech. So here comes all the numbers. Now, I, have, I, I don't memorize these numbers, so I'm going to look at the slides just like you guys. Uh, the big fact here is that there's about a half million in population growth that's coming between now and 2050, and another 300,000 households. Job growth is robust at 300,000. Uh, in fact, your unemployment rate is one of the nicest in the whole country. In fact, that unemployment rate signals that you actually need more people here. Um, in order to create a competitive job market. So you, you, have, you have to create the right kind of environment to draw people in to this community. And even if you don't, you still have growth to cope with. You are the growth center of Ohio. And it's kind of astounding to look at these numbers. You're growing 25%. The rest of Ohio is losing population, 3% by 3%. So you have this great asset. So, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here. You have no crises, <laughs> and you have, you have solid growth. Why bother thinking about it? Um, maybe the reason you're in good shape is because you continue to bother about thinking about the future. And that's, I, I would always applaud, applaud. This is the big shift that you have to get your brain around and think through. Uh, 44% of new households in this next 35 years are gonna be seniors. What kind of housing do they need? Where do they wanna live? How can it be an affordable lifestyle for them and a complete, you know, socially robust life? Um, the, the normal growth segment of the wage earner and family population is down at 31% and you have a big jump in the young people which is good. You could probably handle an even bigger jump in young people. You probably want more people graduating out of Ohio State staying here. So um, it's a completely new uh, market in terms of what kind of housing fits. And it seems radical, but unfortunately the demographics are radical. And so the response has to be radical. 
And these numbers, if you look at the third bar over, um, what you see is the increment. And now this is an age group, this is household type. Singles living alone will be 55% of new household formation. So of those 300,000 new houses, they gotta be for, over half of them, have to be for single people. Uh, excuse me, that doesn't fit large lot subdivisions. That's not the answer to that question. Um, Households without children, that's the empty nesters, that's the young couples, uh, that's 31%. Only 19% are traditional families with kids. And so there's, there's a, you know, a dramatic shift, as I've already pointed out. And the ending numbers, but that seems weird, crazy, uh, you know, maybe unbalanced. But when you blend that in growth increment with the existing population, you're still in a pretty nice balance. 34% senior, uh, single people living alone, 38% are families without children, and 28%, which is like the national norm now of traditional families with kids. But, you know, a little more than a quarter. So you're still a little more family oriented than the rest of the country. Uh, this is, uh, Housing preference by age group, and the long and short here, when you unpack it, is that, of course, it's the small lot and attached housing that really dominates as you get older and when you're younger. There's a time in life for that large lot single family. It's not your entire life. And that's why communities need a whole range of housing types. And the problem with the suburbs have been that we decided that, that it's, as I said before, it's one size fits all. It's one housing type for everybody. And there are whole communities that either force people into something that's not quite a good fit, or they end up with one segment of the full demographic. Now, that has lots of interesting implications. What I keep hearing when I come here is that schools are a big issue. Well. Looking forward, clearly, we're not going to generate as many kids per household as, we, as you had. And so the, the, the overall school population, while not declining, will level off. And that, that push-pull. But the real issue here is the distribution of school-age kids. When you have whole communities that have nothing but families with kids, and whole communities where you don't have families with kids, and you have local tax structures that you know, basically live off local income tax and local property tax, you have huge asymmetries. So those communities that have a lot of schools and a lot of school age kids are struggling to make ends meet because they don't have households without kids to contribute to their tax base. And they do. So there's a, a wonderful synergy that could evolve here, which is if you have places for those empty nesters to go, not leave their community, but actually move to a townhouse or a cottage or an, a condo, but stay in their community, they become taxpayers that contribute to the schools without contributing kids. And all of a sudden that gets back into balance. So balanced communities are really a, an important idea, both socially and economically. And part of what this whole exercise is beginning to reveal is that you have that opportunity to get to. Um, home type, attached, small lot. So you'll notice here at the bottom, small lot, we're saying zero need. Now, that doesn't mean we're saying there's no new single family large lot developed here. Uh, it's saying that the market demand is pretty small, given the demographics, and that people entering that market will if there's a healthy turnover of single family, there's plenty of inventory to handle it. So people leaving single family homes will free up capacity for people who are entering that phase of life. Um, and yes, there'll always be you know, the next really high-end community for somebody who wants to buy something brand new. But there's a lot of people who enjoy just moving into a mature neighborhood and fixing up a house that hopefully has been left by um, some empty nesters who have moved to a local residence. That's not going to happen if the city doesn't allow that multifamily or that townhouse or that small lot development to happen. 
And so therein lies the whole issue. And you know, I, I may be spending too much time on this, but <laughs> it's, it's really a, a fundamental paradigm shift that it's hard for people to understand. I get pushed back all the time from people saying, you're attacking the American dream. You know, the American dream is a large house and cars and mobility and freedom. Uh, and I just say, well, yeah, but if you're 75 years old, driving a lot doesn't, and maintaining a yard really isn't what you want. And actually, if you're 25, you probably would rather be downtown in a cool urban location. So it's really who you're talking about when you make those global statements about what America wants. OK, so now what kind of growth? So this is the, to the methodology we use. And this is a simplified first step, which is let's think of growth in three basic patterns. One is standard sprawl, which is subdivisions, office parks, and shopping malls. And the other one is compact, which is kind of like a mixed use, more uh, mixed uh, development of housing types in a walkable environment, but still very low density. It's not downtown. And the third one being urban, the kind of stuff you're seeing built around here, you know, real info. But it's not just in downtown Columbus. It can happen in the center of towns throughout the region. So there are really three typologies. And they have different complexions in terms of transportation needs and, and densities, uh, but I won't go into that. So urban places, this is the urban typology. And what we're doing is we're saying we're going to build uh, futures by thinking about different place types, not just housing types, but whole places. So urban is like what's happening downtown. It's uh, high density, it's walkable, it's mixed use. Uh, and you know, there's so many studies out now that show that this type of development is, you know, in terms of the innovation economy and the millennium generation, we see it right now in the Bay Area where all the big high tech companies want to be in San Francisco. Why? Because that's where all the innovative young people are. And they don't want to be in San Jose in the suburbs, in the office parks. They want to be in urban environments. And so there, with Glazer and with uh, Richard Florida doing their studies, it's shown that there's a high correlation between this kind of next generation economy, innovation and entrepreneurial spirit, and urban lifestyles. And so there's, there's a certain momentum to this that maybe people don't see themselves involved in, but can be an important, not only a social and lifestyle option, but also a very important economic uh, uh, growth element. And you know, I can go on and on because I actually do think Columbus, low crime, beautiful urban form uh, compared to many other cities. You know, it's, it's an extraordinary city to build on. And it's a, kind of a no-brainer, really. I mean, it's, it, it'll happen naturally if you don't get in the way. And my understanding is with the 10,000 population or units, is it 10,000 units or population? They had this goal? Just population? No, no, turn that into units. 10,000 units you should do, build downtown. It's very healthy. You know, downtowns historically have been hollowed out. The residential went away. And if they were lucky, they stayed as business districts. Now they need to be whole cities again, housing and jobs. And you can do it here. It's harder in a place like downtown Oakland, where you have a depressed economy and high crime rates. And yet, in today's environment, market environment, this kind of thing, and it's interesting, same number, 10,000 units in downtown Oakland was what the past mayor, Jerry Brown, called for. And it's happening. And there's a whole renaissance of the downtown. So these are market forces at work that, if you don't get in their way, will occur quite naturally. This is one of the downtown development areas. Now, compact is more complex. People don't quite understand. It. It's somewhere in between urban and suburban. Uh, but it's actually what America was prior to World War II. We used to have great downtowns and then streetcar suburbs. And the streetcar suburbs were these villages where Elm Street m led to Main Street. People could walk easily. And there was a whole mix of housing, apartments and townhouses and bungalows. Bungalows and small lot single family really being the starter home. 
all woven together in a simple urban fabric where everything was connected and nothing was separated. And you have a lot of them. And note in this graph that they're not just downtown. So these compact development, which is built out of lower density stuff, you know, some low rise apartments for seniors, maybe some townhouses, a whole lot of small lot single family, which by the way here, I'm surprised is as large as 7,000 square feet, which I consider large lot, but around here I guess it's considered small. Um, you might want to tighten your belt on that one a little bit too <laughs> over time because, you know, the reality is, you know, there's a wonderful interaction here. We, we spent several generations privatizing everything. You, you had to have your own playground in your backyard. Uh, whatever happened to the neighborhood park where the kids got to come together and the playground was shared instead of everybody having their own private playground. I think we're reaching that stage of economic maturity where it's actually better socially to share a lot of this stuff and it's more economic and it's envir environmentally more uh, sustainable. A good example of a compact is one of our projects, which is just outside of downtown, which uh, Denver, uh, Stapleton, the old airport, it's uh, now 10,000 units, and it went through the 08 crash without any um, uh, foreclosures. It continued to build and sell houses right through the recession. Uh, it's such a desirable place, and it's largely single family, small lot, smaller than seven, and uh, a, a whole mix of places, walkable town center and uh, retail and jobs over, and a whole range of housing types. In the upper left is the cottage. Those are just 3,000 square foot lots, but they're detached single family, and for a lot of people, that really works. What's fascinating is that those bungalows and that large home on the right are a block and a half apart. And th those used to go for, I don't know what the current number is, about 180,000 a unit to get into one of the bungalows. And the other one, the, the big houses were 1.5 million. Economic segregation is not a must in the marketplace. These, these mixed use compact communities have demonstrated that over and over again. You can mix full range of people and they actually thrive on the interaction rather than and open space, that's another thing about the compact rather than the downtown urban infill, is you get, to, you get to create parks and schools and open space networks that you don't get in the downtown. Easton is an, a great example, one of the premier and first uh, examples of this type of development was actually pioneered here. Uh, and it's now backfilling a lot of housing and becoming a much more complete community. Standard, you know what it looks like. I, you know, we always show slides. Uh, it had a big place in the American history. The question is, is it the right pattern moving forward? Um, is it gonna fill the needs? And what do we do with all this stuff? Um, I think the answer is simple, actually. We can zone for redevelopment and infill, and over time, you can create real places where there aren't real places. That's what we always did. You can only do that, by the way, if you have growth, which the good news is you have growth. Now here's a place here in, in, uh, outside of Columbus that has everything that a real city needs. It needs a, a lot of retail, residential of different types, office, and yet the connecting fabric, it's not just about density. It's not just about mix. It's actually about urban design. Here's an environment that's fairly high density and diverse, and yet it doesn't function as a real place. So we wouldn't count this as compact, even though it's just as dense as the compact model we use in the computer analysis that we do. Um, okay, so now down to the nitty gritty. Let me get a little drink here first. So we created four scenarios. You look, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I sound a little biased, do you think? Do I, you know, do I have an attitude? Um, probably. And so, you know, I keep doing this like there's something there. Um, and I, I'll admit to you, I am. And, but it's because I've done enough of these analyses and I always see similar results. Um, 
But we try to be really straightforward, and the computer model that we've developed has been tested in various communities across the country and literally peer-reviewed ad nauseum by cynics and people who don't like the results and don't want to acknowledge the results. And so it's a kind of bulletproof analysis. And the technique we use is to say, OK, let's posit different futures. And let's measure their impacts honestly, empirically. And let's just digest the results. You guys can do whatever you want with these results. Uh, you know, I have my opinion about what you should do. But I don't even live here, so I don't count. What, the question is what you decide to do with these results and how you think about them. They're just information, but they are honest information. So we said, let's take one scenario and just say the past trends are projected on an even line into the future. You build the same kind of stuff you've always been building. You make no policy changes. You make no land use changes. You just continue. The second one is the planned future, which is actually a reflection of the new uh, zoning and master plans in each community and all the pipeline projects and subdivisions that are already out there. The third one, focus growth, is really dominated, and I'll show you this, by compact development, some urban infill. Um, and to a certain degree, what we discovered, and we did shape it around this idea, that it fits the demographic market. It's a, a more coherent response to the housing demand that, that I've described earlier. The fourth one, maximum infill, is really saying, what if you chase this um, notion of the innovation economy, that it's, a, that it's an urban, that, that urban environments, vital, strong urban environments, generate the next generation of jobs in ways that other places don't. And so those are the four, and each one is viable. Each one is interesting, and we'll look at the results. Uh, and these describe them. Uh, existing, your 85% standard low-density suburban. Trends, obviously, almost identical. Uh, the plans already that you have in place in this uh, region are beginning to shift towards compact, uh, which is the 28% there. And then focus, where we really kind of let that dominate. And this is for the increment. This isn't for everybody. This is for the, ha the new housing, the new 300,000 units that are coming. It's not for the whole population. 84% compact. Now, remember, compact is bungalows, single family, small lot, townhouse, apartments. It's a mix of everything. It's not just one thing. And then D, the 27% urban, is really saying, well, focus a lot of the regional energy in the downtown and really create one of those cities that becomes a global magnet for the intelligence worker. Um, now, what happens, and this is very important, when you blend that 30 years of growth with your existing housing stock, you end up with still close to 60% in standard uh, suburban environments. So we're not abandoning the American dream. It's still there. It's just in proportion to the demand that's out there. It's, not been left behind in any stretch of the imagination. So these two things, this is the increment, and this is what happens after the increment has been blended with the existing. So a lot of people say, oh, you know, you're against a single family home. No, there's plenty of single family homes. <coughs> maybe we overbuilt it is the only question I ask, and maybe that had something to do with 2008, but that's a whole other discussion I don't want to get into. Um, See, these, this gets even more boring as it goes on. I, you know, you'll have to bear with me. But you really got to be a nerd for uh, planning to sit through one of these <laughs> talks. Um, I don't even know what the hell this one is. New. <laughs> See, Joe, there's just too much information. You can only put so much information on a slide. This is the four scenarios, and it's broken down not by uh, by place type, but just to make things complicated and nuanced, it's by building type. So there's a proportion of multifamily, uh, townhouse is the light blue, small lot is the nice blue, because we like that, and uh, large lot, and this is for the new growth. So you can see what's happening here. It's basically, these are the programs that populate the computer model 
to uh, generate the res results. Okay, so that's what those three scenarios, uh, four scenarios are. And the good news is we've discovered as we do this analysis, we can end up with a whole range of impacts. And we can begin to see the, the whole spectrum and the relationship between that very first slide of all these crises and what, it, what these different growth patterns generate. And so we have all these things and I'm gonna go through them. The first one, the simplest one to calculate on a computer is land consumption. And what's astounding is the difference. Most people don't realize it. We can build, um, let's put this back here. Actually, I haven't made this linkage. If you look at C focus, we're building only 30% multifamily, which by the way is, is the national norm. You know, 30% of housing in America is multifamily today. So that's not some weird thing to do. Uh, 20, 30% small lot, 27% large lot. If you build it that way versus uh, under trends, uh, you save 450 square miles of ag land. Now, some environmentalists may be excited about this, but what I found interesting is that this is one of the biggest elements of your economy is agribusiness. And so preserving ag land is actually an economic development strategy. It's not just an environmental strategy. It's not just historic preservation of farmlands. It's, it's an economic approach. As a matter of fact, the group that we talked to today, this morning, um, that's focused on economic development has, has one of their four primary economic development areas, agribusiness. So you see the crossover between, the results have multiple implications. Uh, well, this more compact, say 45 square miles, how big is Columbus again? See, Columbus, but Columbus is one of the biggest city jurisdictions in the country. Interesting fact, because they expanded their city boundary into the suburbs. Many cities became landlocked by their suburbs and economically suffered because of it. Somebody in Columbus a long time ago did something smart and decided that they were going to capture some of their own suburbs and thereby get a more diverse population and a better economic base. That's uh, a whole other story. But nonetheless, uh, you can see that the amount of growth you're going to have under trend is twice, basically building two cities of Columbus in the next 35 years. Imagine what your landscape, what your region feels like when you do that. And this, these numbers finally give you a chance to actually understand the scale issues that, that, that's at stake here. Household driving, that's the other big, you know, there are two 800 pound gorillas, land consumption and auto dependence. How auto dependent are you in the future? And what implications does that have? Well, the average per capita driving uh, now is around 6,000. And we, we like to confuse you with these numbers, so we're gonna change metrics all over the place. So this is per person. Later on, I'll talk about per household. And it's just to trip you up, basically. But you'll notice that the average uh, per capita goes down very significantly. Land use impacts travel behavior in really big ways. And it's not just that everybody gives up the car and they you know, uh, get Brooklyn-Stotts and ride bicycles. It's because the trips are shorter. It's actually very simple. You know, if destinations are closer, if communities are more compact, there's more opportunity for walking to local destinations. And then when you get in the car, it's just not as far to go. Look back at those land numbers. If you were to put two Columbuses into this region, the scale of the region, like Atlanta, would balloon and every trip would become longer. So that explains that. Vehicle miles traveled, um, the total, this is the aggregate, this is way, is that you're now, and this one is important to understand, you're now, there's about two billion uh, vehicle miles traveled across this whole region. And it's not causing a lot of congestion. If you went with A or B, you would have up to 16 billion uh, uh, vehicle miles traveled. You would start to have serious congestion. Um, but interestingly enough, C holds that same level of auto travel, even while adding 
500,000, half a million more people. So these are important things. Um, cars off the road, I'll skip that one. This one is really I important. The value of the travel saved in terms of pocketbook issues, and as I pointed out earlier, one of the biggest burdens per household is travel costs. And part of that is uh, just fuel, but it's more than that. It's insurance, it's parking, it's maintenance, it's all that other stuff. But just fuel alone, $18.5 billion difference over these different futures. Um, so that's a big one. That translates, we've got respiratory, we don't have obesity into the model yet, uh, but air quality hits uh, kids with asthma. And you have to ask yourself, are people moving to a place where their kids are gonna be harmed by the air? Or, or does this become one of the better places in the country where you move and it's a healthy environment? Uh, total energy use obviously goes down. More compact homes gener uh, demand less energy naturally. Before you get into cool solar panels and energy conservation strategies. Total building energy costs 2.3 billion. These are numbers that start to add up. How expensive is it to operate your region? You know, everybody thinks about the cost of operating a city or a business, and they want to cut costs. That's a, you know, that's a value that seems to be on the rise these days, cutting costs, cutting government costs. But these are costs that are at the regional scale that we tend to ignore, and I think accounting for them is very important. Water, same picture. Uh, so it does look like this deck is stacked, uh, but the deck is stacked empirically. These, these trends, these different futures will generate these big differences in environmental, social, and economic uh, impacts. This is a really big one to me. You don't have quite the same affordable housing crisis that other places do, but as we watch the median income in America fall behind costs, and costs keep rising and median income stays flat, a savings of $5,000 per household is a big deal. And this is something that's of great consequence. Once again, I think you're gonna see economically places that are too expensive losing jobs, losing businesses to areas that are more affordable. And so if Columbus, so you can think about this as either social equity and you're concerned about low-income houses, or you could think about it as economic development, that this is a region that's attractive to businesses because the workforce isn't being penalized by their everyday lifestyle. Uh, so interesting how you can reframe all these things. This is when you blend it. So this is the savings for that increment of a half million, and this is the savings for everybody at the, at the end of the road of this this decision-making process. So in 2050, uh, on average, everybody will be saving $4,000 if you choose scenario D. Uh, greenhouse gas, climate change. Lots of debate about whether this is important. I won't get into that, but the reality, of course, is compact development makes for uh, uh, healthier environments. And finally, we tried to get into, and believe me, it has been mind-boggling, the fiscal impacts on cities of these different scenarios. Because you have such a varied and complex tax system. And it varies by county and township and city. Uh, and you know, there are vectors going in all directions. The bottom line with all this, um, is that we measured the cost of future development. And that's just a fixed capital cost. And then we looked at the fiscal impacts to municipal governments under the different scenarios. Now, the infrastructure and service costs are kind of straightforward. We can do this calculation easily because we know the different growth patterns. We know how many roads and utilities and all of us that. You also know how spread out a community is and therefore how difficult police fire services become how much you have to spend in operations and maintenance, how many roads you have to maintain, things like that. But the more complex thing, as I said, is the income tax, the property tax, all these other variables. So infrastructure cost naturally goes down. More compact, less roads, less maintenance, 
uh, and you know, quite serious savings. That's $3.2 billion. Remember way back we, when I was on the transportation side, it was $18 billion in savings. So all these things add up, and I think we add them up at the end. Um, per annum, eight, uh, 80 million. Uh, the revenues do odd things, and we haven't fully sorted all this out uh, because uh, the, you know, there's a dip there with B, where the plans are producing less revenues. And I won't get into that. If you really are into this, go online. You can read the whole report, and there's an appendix that's bigger than a report on this fiscal analysis. Uh, but if you think about it as revenues per acre of development, you get a very clear picture about what makes sense and what doesn't. And don't forget, you know, if you have less acres, you have less maintenance costs, you have less infrastructure costs. So the relationship between costs and revenues are probably more clearly expressed by this graph. All of which leads us to a, a pretty interesting final, not a final conclusion, but if your most important variable, for some people, environmental issues are most important. For others, social issues, are, and for others, economic. I think you have to think about all three simultaneously, but the economic issues are big. And you can see here, the, say, the costs, the very top is home energy costs in billions. Uh, the middle is auto fuel costs, and the bottom is infrastructure and operations and maintenance. So there's you know, very big differences. Did you put the delta on here? 21, $22 billion in difference in these different futures. That shouldn't be the only thing that you're concerned with, but it's certainly something you have to think about. So with that exciting uh, data endnote, uh, we leave you with, the, with, these, with this information. And uh, I don't have to challenge you. You guys have already challenged yourselves. I mean, what's ex extraordinary about your community is, as I started off saying, your community without a uh, deadly crisis, and yet you've challenged yourself to look to be forward thinking. This is a tool to think about the future. That's all it is. Uh, it maybe clarifies a lot of issues so that people can begin to grapple with them with a different level of discussion. Uh, there are lots of interesting next steps that we can take, but um, what we need now is to put this information out to the public and have everybody digest it, ask their questions, do their thinking, come together. I think implicit in this kind of work is new kinds of coalitions that didn't exist before. As interest groups tend to center around different categories of stuff, uh, these kinds of analysis show that there are natural coalitions that maybe haven't been formed yet uh, for different kinds of actions, policies, and futures. And that's the most exciting part to me, is that sometimes these analyses change the political chemistry of, and the, di the public dialogue. And I hope that happens here. Thank you very much. I think this is working. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Very insightful. Good stuff. And for those uh, data geeks that love that stuff, this is your yeah. heyday. For the rest of you, we apologize. Yeah. Um, one of the things, as uh, uh, so we think through this kind of regional analysis, it gets me looking at the stuff we did in Dublin. And I think of that demographic information up front that people are trying to digest and understand what the implications are. Uh, one of the most profound ways I've seen in the analysis here that kind of jumps out is that the growth we're looking at for this next 30, 40 year period, over 80% of the growth in households is one and two person households without kids. I mean, that, that's an extraordinary difference when Morpsey put the data together to look back at the last 40 years, and you see it on the trend analysis, it's almost exclusively this large lot single family as baby boomers aged and kind of moved up and kind of created this, this scenario the drivers for the last 40 years from a demographic perspective and the next one are, are radically different. So you look at a series of scenarios, some of which say if we were to continue to add the 500,000 people as we added our last bunch of people, here's what the land consumption cost, the other implications would be. We also look at other scenarios, uh, two of which are far more compact at the end. But I guess my question, Peter, is at the end of the day, I think when we had Chris Leinberger come in, he to some extent said, 
the suburbanization that's happened was a very kind of rational response to the, the demographics and the other things that were driving it at the time. The market kind of responded, and lots of us were planners the last 20, 30 years. Why aren't developers building more of this kind of stuff as opposed to the single family neighborhoods? It seems as if the data suggests if the market is producing what's being demanded with 80 plus percent of the household growth being one and two person households without kids, a lot of that being empty nester, isn't a lot of scenario C and D going to happen just with normal market forces? Yeah, but market forces are often frustrated by planning documents, zoning, planning boards, local planning, uh, city councils or township, what do you call them? I don't think he's speaking to Powell in particular on this. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, there's a, you know, tragically, um, or maybe not tragically, I mean, this is a kind of a philosophical question. Inertia is the most powerful force in the universe. I mean, once a certain pattern or character or identity is established, changing it is very difficult. So at the same time, the market forces are asking for something different, the local community residents and their elected officials don't want change. We see this all over the place. And so there's this, there is a struggle to be had in this. Uh, you know, and the fact ULI understands and its membership understands and the development community and I think probably even banks at this point understand you don't want to invest in the wrong kind of housing, it's just going to collapse again. Um, you don't want to build the wrong thing and yet communities are scared of having something different arrive. And, you know, and sometimes when you do an analysis like this, this is great for people who want to think at a regional scale, but the local people who show up at their city council hearing uh, are going to say, I don't care about our regional performance or whether we have economic growth or we save, you know, 450 square miles of ag land. I care about what's going to happen next door to me. Uh, and that's where there's, and then there are legal rights, right? There are existing zoning laws that are hard to change because they are vested. Uh, so it's, it's not easy for the public sector to stay up to speed with the market forces. And therein lies the challenge that we have. If, um, if a community chooses to say, we want to remain the character that we've developed. We kind of like the single family, family oriented nature. That's kind of what we want to continue to be kind of going forward. Um, it would seem that one of the implications of that would be that's fine, but for the next 40 years, if you've got a lot of land to absorb, you're going to have to absorb a ton bigger share of the market because there's going to be so little of that relative to the last 40 years if you want to continue being growing with large lot single family development because the demographics suggest assuming seniors sell and how long they stay in households are questioned. But aren't communities going to have to uh, get accustomed to the notion that the things driving that single family development are radically different and they're going to have to capture a much bigger share of the region's supply of that if that's what they're going to depend on for the residential growth? Well, I, I think that they're going to have a lot of issues to confront. Um, <laughs> I think what happens in those places that don't want to move into the future uh, is that they can be left behind. You know, as the demand for single family falls and the economic capacity to value it highly falls, then values fall, uh, revenues fall, services fall, vacancy rates rise, and all of a sudden you have a community on decline. And you know, somebody in those local jurisdictions have to realize that they can actually, you know, sustaining the identity they have today may be very difficult. Now, that doesn't mean that communities don't do that all the time and fail. As a matter of fact, we did it as a whole country and then we failed in 08. The real estate debacle, the bubble was really the whole country denying the shift, the demographic and economic shift that had already taken place, which is, the middle class had declining, you know, proportion of families with kids. They had declining household size, mm -hmm. uh, and they had declining disposable income. And yet they kept buying bigger and bigger houses in more and more remote locations. Well, the, the, uh, the banks made that possible for a while. They propped it up by subsidizing it with, um, you know, low rate loans. Uh, but then we all see what happens with that. 
So I think the same thing will happen. These communities that don't choose to change really could decline. And I don't know how the politics of that play out. I mean, you know, how, you, how do you get in front of that? How do you convince communities that if they're not balanced, they're vulnerable? It's, it's a tough sell. I'm not, none of this is easy, to tell you the truth. And you all know that. It's going to be very difficult. On the other hand, you can argue to people, look, you've got a lot of single family housing, but a lot of people occupying it now are empty nesters. Uh, they would rather stay in the community because all their social life and fabric is vested there. Why not build housing for them so that they can relocate within your community? And by the way, they're then paying property taxes that help cover the schools, but they're not contributing kids to the schools. So your balance sheet on schools gets better. So I think there are ways of framing it that make it um, logical. But it's always a struggle because the knee jerk is always against change. I think part of uh, even the folks from Morpsey and, and ULI and, and Columbus 2020 is to make sure we at least do the best job of communicating the data, the demographics, what the yeah. implications yeah. seem to be so that folks who do make decisions about growth and development and zoning and land use and infrastructure can at least make it as well informed as they can. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and right after that, I'm going to open it up to the public there. So any of you who would like to uh, approach the mic there to, to ask Peter questions directly can do so now. Um, but Peter, one of the things that people have asked us is, uh, okay, we do the analysis, we understand the impacts of the region's growth and development, and, and here's all the good fiscal information, here's the demographic information. Uh, you've done this for other regions. Uh, I know a lot of it started in, in California and some state laws there that emerged. But even places like Salt Lake City, which I think in, from a at least politically conservative perspective, uh, wouldn't be painted with the same brush as, uh, as some of the California communities. Or as Portland. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, on that, what, what comes from this kind of analysis based on your experience? Well, the, the, you know, uh, I'm a very partisan person, so I have to be honest with everybody, you know. And just like I say, I am biased about the re results, but I don't. Um, I don't manipulate the results. Um, but I find this to be really a nonpartisan issue. Uh, you know, and Salt Lake is a great example. Everybody thinks of Portland as a poster child of smart growth and this kind of thing. But, and so we were happy to get work in Salt Lake where it was hy you know, hypothetically conservative. We did the same scenario analysis. And for different reasons, different p political alignments happened. And in the end, they adopted you know, state legislation called the Quality Growth Initiative, which basically you know, lays out a whole line of carrots uh, in front of smart growth and pretty much says, if you want to do the old stuff, you're on your own. Now, how did that happen? Well, the Mormon church, believe it or not, which you think of as the most conservative of all, loved the idea of walkable communities because you know, everybody's supposed to walk to the ward house. So there was an unexpected sympathy there. But more importantly, they cared about the next generation being able to afford housing in the Salt Lake area. And interestingly enough, because all that was being built there was not just large lot, but super large lot, um, there was no entry point into the equity ladder of housing. There was no place for first time buyers. Uh, and affordability was going in the tank because actually it's a very thriving, desirable place. Uh, and so they saw the new housing mix as a solution to their desire to actually have the next generation stay and remain a part of the, their community. Then the state legislature, which is filled with fiscal conservatives, looked at the uh, f cost and financial burden of different forms of growth. They were struggling with uh, a huge quantum step in costs for water. If they exceeded a certain level of water consumption, they had to build whole new res reservoirs, whole new delivery systems, and they would have to raise taxes, which they hate to do. And so all of a sudden they saw that actually under a scenario that met the true market demand even there and was endorsed by the Mormon church, they could have a growth pattern that didn't require these tax increases. And so they got 100% behind it. And then lo and behold, the, the last place in the world you think transit would take off is, 
And there they are, they're building transit everywhere. Every city is demanding to have the next transit station in their community because they know it revitalizes, revitalizes and diversifies the community. So it's a big uh, success story, but it wasn't driven by environmentalists or people advocating for social equity. It was driven by different politics. But in the end, the facts help. Mm -hmm. And the facts create, uh, catalyze new political coalitions in interesting ways. And so I, I think that these, uh, the shift is so clear uh, that um, once people get the information, uh, they get very smart about it, no matter who they are and where they're coming from. Uh, so um, thank you very much. This is all really great information. Um, so my question is, and I think you were just starting to talk about it, is like, who is the best audience for this? Um, in order to, to sort of be prepared for this future and get to where we know we need to be, you know, is it the, you know, the municipal city administrators? Is it the city council people and the, and the, and the planners and, and that crowd? It's certainly not this crowd because we all get it here. Um, or is it the soccer moms and the grandparents and young professionals in that group? Um, you know, who, who needs to hear this um, to really make some, have some effect and, and, and make some change? And by the way, I, I asked the same question to Ed McMahon, who's a ULI senior fellow, when he was here a few weeks ago, and he sort of avoided the issue by saying both, so that answer isn't available. <laughs> <laughs> or at least who's the, who's the first, who's the first best audience? Or how do you sort of get this out there to have some effect? Well, I honestly believe the best audience is everybody, and the you know the co you know the cost burden of getting it to everybody is a big one, and that's a heavy lift. So the question is, what can you do within reasonable limits? In Salt Lake, uh, we actually had a newspaper insert that summarized all the numbers, and asked people to just mail back uh, cards with their thoughts, uh, and you know. It's, if people like to be engaged, they like information, and then they like the chance to send in feedback. And then we publish the results of all the, the, you know, it was almost like a survey, a regional survey. So there are techniques like that. There's online stuff that you can do to spread it. It's, I like the idea that it's ubiquitous. And maybe it needs to be simplified. You, you know, for each venue, communication venue, needs to be thought through. Um, there's another thought, I mean, I think everybody's now thinking about what next steps is what you're really asking about, not just how do you reach everybody, but what's the logical next step? And, uh, you know, it may be that there are some case studies that need to be done. You know, this is a little abstract, you know, the, the planned future and the, what is compact and what is the focused future and, uh, you know, unfortunately, once again, for people in this room, I think you get it, but the average person, that, that often gets misconstrued. What, what do these things really mean? What do they look like? What do they feel like to live in? And so some case, you know, deeper, a little drill down on case studies sometimes is good. Uh, working with one or two local cities that want to be pilots and say, you know, do, do a more detailed plan and do the analysis on those detail plan using the tools that we have. Um, so there's several roads forward, I think, at this point. And I think that our steering committee is just going to have to sort that out. Next question. Hi. Um, a lot of what you're talking about has been embraced in different places around the country, uh, but, but, but seems more so in larger cities. Here we're talking about a, a multi-county region and the surrounding counties are largely rural and agricultural. Is a lot of what you're saying an easier sell in a metropolitan area than in these rural areas? How, is there, is there uh, uh, a different approach in taking the same message to the uh, to the county seats in the rural towns. Well, there's two parts to that this isn't a particularly small region in terms of population. I mean, you compare it to Salt Lake and Portland, they're all kind of comparable. They're not. It's not a giant difference. The the you know how much of the suburbs are true suburbs versus large lot, uh, rural lot, we call them, you know, the five acre, 10 acre lot things. Um, 
we did a lot of work in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where the rural lots were really a big issue. And it was a big lifestyle component. Um, I think that, it, you know, I don't think you can change the facts. I mean, the facts are the facts, and these are the facts, and you just have to present it to everybody and just say, well, not everybody's going to live on a rural estate for the rest of their lives. They may not afford it, they may not want it. And so, um, you know, I don't think the methodology changes. Um, I think you have to be very careful, though, about how you describe it. One of the things that I find worst in this is the kind of misinterpretation, sometimes intentional misinterpretation of these facts. And so people will say, well, this is, you know, and I've gotten this so many times in so many communities, this is un-American, you know, this isn't who we are. Uh, you're stealing my freedom. I mean, I have people come to workshops in different places across the country claiming that this is a UN conspiracy. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. They call it Agenda 21. How many of you have heard of that? Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, uh, you know, so there is this thing of being very thoughtful about not being vulnerable to intentional or unintentional misinterpretations. And I think that's the only way I could handle what you're talking about is you go out to those rural communities and they've heard that this smart growth stuff is communist um, and it's foreign. Uh, and you need to find a way to communicate it you know, it is really as American as apple pie. I mean, the classic rural village is not very different than what we're advocating for in terms of compact growth. Uh, and, you know, us in the new urbanist movement have been criticized up and down by the hip uh, architectural establishment who finds that retro um, to harken back to Elm Street and Main Street somehow touching each other, uh, but on some fundamental social level, it's a deep need, I think. And, you know, dress it up in the fancy architecture, whatever you want. But people, kids should be able to walk freely from, from their home to a park or the school or the soda shop. I'm sorry. Uh, and then we can argue about whether or not that's retro or not. Uh, Joe, Joe Sullivan. Uh, you touched on a little bit in your conversation, but I'd like you to expand a little bit how transit plays into this whole fact of, of uh, our growing more densely because uh, growing densely is restricted by the automobile as long as that's the, the primary means that if we don't have alternatives, then there's only so much we can do. Uh, and that uh, because we don't have uh, enough pain uh, locally in the sense of our commutes and uh, driving to work, which we're still going to have to do even if we have walkable neighborhoods. Uh, work is not likely a case where you're walking to work. So how does that play into the future and how do we kind of get transit to be part of this message? Well, that's a really complicated and good question. Um, first of all, remember that the commute trip, which is typically the, the backbone of transit systems, is only 25% of household trips. The other 75% are to local destinations, more often than not. And they're short. And so actually, if you have a complete community, and Stapleton now is mature enough to be that, a lot of people <coughs> tell me they live there, and you know, but for work, they you know, occasionally go at somewhere else. But a lot of times, they bike and walk right there. And they're not cr crazy hippies. You know, they're just ordinary people that find it more convenient. But it's only more convenient if it's more convenient. You know, I mean, if it's if you it, you know if it's down the cul-de-sac road and to a six-lane arterial with no sidewalks and then you know somehow getting across and going, that's not convenient. Um, so I think there's a big part of this that it, that isn't doesn't even depend on transit per se. Um, now that's not that transit's irrelevant or not important. It's very important. But it is, uh, a lot of this happens anyway, or can happen anyway. As a matter of fact, once again, Stapleton is finally now, after 10,000 units and all sorts of local walking and biking trips and local destinations, uh, uh, and kids free, this is one of my passions, is the idea of a 10-year-old who can't go anywhere without 
a chauffeur um, driving them. I mean, you know, what does that do to human development to be that dependent? Um, but anyway, it's only now getting its transit. It's 15 years later, and it's evolved very, in a very healthy way without transit. So that's not, okay, now the flip side, why transit? Because at a regional structure, uh, access to those job centers really has to have other means besides the car. Um, and the distribution of job centers and how they're linked by transit to uh, housing segments are, is very, very important. So that 25% of trips, um, it, it, that's not all the carbon, that's not all the household cost, but it is the thing that generates the congestion. And it is the thing that if you in, treat it intelligently with transit, can create vital urban centers. So downtowns really become powerful and town centers become powerful when they're linked by transit. So I, it's a both and thing to me. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Trent? Hey, Terry. Um, so this is kind of a simplistic question, but I'm thinking about the demographics that you put up versus the trends that you put up. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, would you chase the empty nester or the trend of the younger urban professional? I think it's both. I mean, the whole point is, the whole point is housing should be diverse. It should, it should meet the needs of a whole life cycle, not just one segment of a life. Um, and, you know, and it should meet the needs of a whole range of income groups. It, you know, cause, and so the one size fits all really doesn't work. And even w one market segment uh, doesn't work. Um, and great communities always mix those. And as you know, you can point out that old Norman Rockwell fantasy of a village or what we used to have in our streetcar suburbs was exactly that. There were SROs over Main Street shops. There were apartments where seniors were living. Uh, there were row houses that were kind of starting families. And there were bungalows down the street. And then there was, out at the end of that street, there was the, you know, the banker with his big mansion. Uh, and it was all part of a whole community, complete community. And that's all, you know, that's, that's the formula, I think. And it's not about people just living downtown or just living in suburbs. It's people living in whole communities that, and each one can be varied. I mean, that's the other thing is that a lot of the misinterpretation is we're trying to uh, rubber stamp the same thing everywhere. You know, everything's gotta be the same everywhere. But, you know, some rural communities can, instead of ranging from five acre lots to five acre lots, could range from five acre lots to, you know, a half acre lots to some bungalows and even some a senior housing and apartments and a, a nice little main street. And that could be that spread. And then the spread down here would be, you know, there can be some high, you've got a high rise, you've got some high rise apartments and low rise and townhouse and uh, Germantown is just fabulous. I mean, as a, as a housing, a complex set of housing opportunities. Diversity is the key. It's the biggest principle, diversity. I think, um ULI, Morpsey, Columbus 2020 are going to continue these discussions. Uh, we're hoping that this information, these data, this analysis spurs more of those discussions regionally because making the decisions consciously upfront of how the region is going to grow, knowing that it's going to grow differently is critical. For those of you who are interested in, uh, in engaging in this, either through any of these organizations or ULI, please feel free to, to do that. Why don't we thank Peter one more time for his uh, presentation here today. And with that, we'll uh, call it a good evening. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much.